This morning we're going to look at uh, a passage of Scripture. I believe as Christians today we need to, we need to uh, be looking at our future. Our future. But yet, <clears throat> and I say that, uh, I say that uh, hesitantly because what we're about to read this morning really is not our future. It's not my future. It's not your future if you're born again. But yet Christ wants us to know what his word says. It's interesting, we're in the book of the Revelation in my Sunday school class at 1030, right here in the sanctuary, and this morning we're going to go back into the book of the Revelation, and we're going to go to Revelation chapter 6, and I've heard people say this over and over again, and I, and I shared this with you before, that there are churches today that will not preach out of the book of the Revelation, you know why? Because they say that it has nothing to do with the church. Well, see, that's bogus, because it has everything to do with the church. Everything to do with it. Well, the church is gone in chapter 4, the book of the Revelation. From chapter 6 through verse, or chapter 19, the church is gone. And the church is not heard of again until uh, late in chapter 19, where it's called the Bride of Christ. Why does it have to do with the church? Well, why did God include it in the full canon of the Scripture? You know, I asked my Sunday school class that. Why has God given us the book of the Revelation? If we're not in it, why has God given it to us? Why has He given it to us in its entirety? And I believe, and we've all come up with the same conclusion, first of all, it's God's word. Secondly, it fulfills his great commission. If you and I know the terrors or the sorrows that are to come, if we're aware of them, at least as much as our mind can be aware of them, then you and I are going to tell people, we should tell people. I can tell you this, though, but when I got saved and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart, a couple years after that, I started sharing that with my friends. They thought I was nuts. They thought I was loony. They thought I went off the deep end. Oh, you got this religious Bible thumper, this religious guy. But when I started talking about the things of the book of the Revelation, the end of, the end of time, they really thought I was nuts. People will think you're nuts when you talk about this time, but it doesn't matter what they think. The only thing that matters is what God says. And this morning, I believe it's important for you and I to know what God says about the times that are to come. And listen, these are future events. They haven't happened yet. But you and I are experiencing the things that we're going to talk about today. And I don't think that we'll get done with this today. Probably next week. I know we were going to continue into the book of the, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. We started that book last week. But I got sidetracked this week, kind of like I do behind the pulpit from time to time. But I got sidetracked this week with this in our pastor's meetings. And I thought, with all the questions and all the things that the pastors had in regards to the book of the Revelation, in regards to the things to come, how many questions do our people have? How many things are there in the book of the Revelation? How many things don't we know? And we talked about scratching the surface last week. I told you that I believe the church, and I use that loosely, the church is, is five miles wide but only a, an, an inch deep. Five miles wide. We lump everything under the umbrella of Christianity today, and the church is only an inch deep. How much do we really know? People won't read the book of the Revelation. It's scary. It's not scary. I used to read it in my Sunday school class. We talked about this. I used to see the book of the Revelation as a book of judgment. How many of you see it as a book of judgment? See, I don't see it that way anymore. Yeah, it is a book of judgment, no doubt about it. So is Ezekiel. So is Isaiah. So are the prophets' writings and teachings in the Old Testament. But this book, God's Word and Revelation, is a book of grace. I, I believe the age of grace is gone. I believe the Holy Spirit is gone once the church is taken out. At the rapture. But God's grace and His mercy is still exhibited through this book. Because God could smoke everything. He could say, I'm done with it. Boom! Gone. But he doesn't. He says a third. He says a third. A quarter. A third. Why not everything? For the first three and a half years, he's taken things out in percentages. He's judging things. He's given men, we talked about it in our Sunday school class and I'll make reference to our Sunday school class several times here because we're studying this book. But one of the, one of the, uh, uh, one of the seal judgments 
One of the trumpet judgments, actually, I think it is. One of the trumpet judgments. One of the judgments. These locusts with scorpion-like tails are going to attack men for five months. And, and the Bible says that men are, going to, men are going to desire to kill themselves. It says they're going to seek death, and death won't find them. They, they can't even kill themselves. But what's something they could do for five months? They could repent, and they don't. In fact, as you go through this entire book, here's what happens as God turns up the heat with these judgments. Boom, judgment, boom, judgment, boom. And the wrath of God, I believe the wrath and judgment of God are two different things. But as these judgments are poured out on the world, what man does is this. How dare you do this to me, God? They shake their hand and they point their finger at God and they blame God. I think it's important today for you and I to know the times to come. I believe it's important because God left us the complete book of Revelation to try to understand as much as we can. A lot of it we can't understand. And a lot of it we can't be dogmatic and say this and say that. And I believe the Bible is the best concordance with the, 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 the Bible uh, explains itself. And so where we can where we can find the truths in the Old Testament in relationship to the, to the book of the Revelation, or in the New Testament in relationship to the, the book of Revelation, we do that. But there's a lot of speculation. But I want you to know this morning, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 6. This is the times to come. The church is gone in chapter 4, and John, John is caught up into heaven. I believe he's seen, the, he's seen the rapture of the church, and when John got the glory... And in, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, the very first thing he saw was the throne room of God. And here I want us to read the first eight verses of the book of uh, Revelation in chapter 6. Just read eight verses, we'll come back and we'll talk about this. And I know this is going to take more than one week. And John says, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were, the noise of thunder. Heaven is a place of sound. He says, one of the four beasts, or living ones, as properly translated, saying, come and see, John, I want you to see this. And I saw, and behold, consider this, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering, and to conquer and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, or living one, say, Come and see, John. And there went out another horse that was red. So we see this, this white horse. We have this red horse. And power was given to him. He didn't have any power himself, but power was given to him. He's under the sovereignty of God. That sat thou on to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the, the third beast, or living one, say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. So we have the white horse, the red horse, the black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living one, or beast, say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, Chlorios, a greenish, yellow, sickly horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. The rider's name was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. There's a fourth. To kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. A very interesting picture as the first four seals, the first four judgments of God are released. I want you to know that I want to make this very clear. You and I, if you've been born again into God's family, if you, uh, if you have received the free gift of God's grace, 
You are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you are born again into God's family, you will not see this time. You will not see it. But then why is it important for me? Why is it important for me to know the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Why is it important for me to understand the first four seals of judgment? Why is it important for me to understand all of the judgments, all of the seal judgments, all of the trumpet judgments, all of the vile judgments? Why is it important for me to see the judgment of God and the wrath of God? Why? Well, you answered that question to yourself as we study this. Because here we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is the four horsemen of the apocalypse is in, a, is in a literary phrase today. We use it commonly today. But this right here, the first eight verses, is the reality of them. They're real events, folks. They haven't happened yet, but they're real events. And it's interesting to look at all this. Because if you and I look around us, do we see, and we looked at the white horse, we, looked at the, we read about the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. So we have deception, the white horse. We have war, the red horse. We have um, famine, the black horse. And we have uh, pestilence with the sickly horse. Do you see rumblings of these around us today? Do you see deception today? Do we have deception in our world today? Turn the news on, folks. Turn the news on. Both of our candidates are running for president are both liars. Is there deception in our world today? Sure there is. Is it right under our noses? Absolutely. The rumblings are all around us. In fact, look in Matthew, keep your finger there in Revolution, Revolution. Yeah, Revelation. And look back in Revelation chapter, uh, Matthew, I'm sorry, 24, and look at verse... 4 to verse 8. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 4 to verse 8. Jesus outlines the signs of his comings and we see the rumblings all around us today. All of this that's taken place and Jesus answered and he said unto them, he says, take heed that no man do what? Deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of what? Wars, and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and there shall be pestilences, and earthquakes, in divers places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. So here in, in Matthew's gospel, Mark chapter 13 talks about it too. Luke chapter 21 talks about it. In, in, in all three, in three gospels, it gives us an order. It talks about deception. Take heed that no man deceive you. It talks about war. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines. Pestilences. The word for pestilences is murine. It's an infection or a disease that we get from livestock. All around us, and you're going to hear this word often used throughout this, this message or series of messages, is all the things that we see, we see the rumblings all around us. Deception, war, famines, pestilences, all those things right now, folks, and you'll hear this over and over again, are currently restrained. What we see with our eye, what we see in the world today, God is restraining. God is holding it back. And it's not like he's going, oh, it's too hard for me. No, 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 no. God has it held back, and someday he's going to lift his hands off of it. And it's going to go forward full force. So what we see today right now are the rumblings. Matthew's gospel calls it the beginning of sorrows. How do I know, Jeff, how do you know that things are restrained today? Well, the Bible tells us, in 2 Thessalonians it tells us that. But how do I know that, that, that these things in the world, that things that are going on around us, the chaos in the world, how do I know that God is holding them back? How do I know that they're restrained? Because you and I are still here. You and I are still here. 
in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 and 14, the Bible tells us, it says that you are the light of the world. The Bible says that you are the salt of the earth. It, it's emphatic in the Greek. You and you alone are the light of the world. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. The church is the light of the world. The church is the salt of the earth. We are the salt and the light. And if it wasn't for the church, folks, chapter 6 would be in full effect today, right now. But what we see around us, everything that's going on around us right now is currently restrained. Look, keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 6 and turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to show you this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 3 to verse 7. Very interesting study. This was not a plug for my Sunday school class. We have, we've been in Sunday school since April of 2015 with the book of the Revelation, and today we're beginning Revelation chapter 13. So it's been a, uh, it's been a race. <laughs> yeah, right. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it, look at verse 3 to verse 7. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. Now Paul wrote this to the church at Thessalonica. He was only there three weeks preaching the gospel to them. And he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, it is actually the day, it's the definite article, the day, because there has always been a day, it is the day, that day or the day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. <laughs> and he's writing this to the church. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember, Paul says, remember, because I told you this, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Look here now. And now... Ye know, now you know, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. There's God's restraint. We know what withholdeth, or who is withholding, that he might be revealed in his time. There's a restraint on him. He can't appear one day early. Look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity, Paul said it's already working in his day, doth already work. Only he who now letteth, that's God, will let until he be taken out of the way. So there, until the restraining is over, then the man of sin, uh, the son of perdition will be revealed. And only then, he's not going to come on scene one day early. But everything right now is restrained, it's held back. God is holding it back. And we look at our world and we go, oh, our world's out in trouble. It's all out of control. I can't believe this is the worst time period that we've ever lived in. And listen, I've talked to a lot of older folks that say the same thing. I've never seen a time in this earth like I've seen today. How many of you can, can actually say that, that this time is worse than you've ever seen? Now think about this. It's restrained. God is holding it back. Now th think about this as crazy as it seems. And I, pr I presented this idea this whole thought to our Sunday school class. Since Roe versus Wade, there's been about 78 million abortions. Listen to this. Restrained today. God is holding it back. Imagine when God lifts his hands off of that, what will happen? Earthquakes, restrained. Tidal waves, restrained. Tsunamis, restrained. Tornadoes, restrained. Our culture, morally, restrained. Our culture, economically, restrained. War, hatred, bigotry, restrained. Just imagine if God let it loose. Look, I believe in a sovereign God. Do you believe in a sovereign God? That's good. Some of you do. That's good. God's going to let it go someday, folks. 
the church won't be here. I told the Sunday school class, I said, you know, people say that, and you read it in the, in the book of the Revelation, the great tribulation. It's talking about the second three and a half year period of time. The great tribulation. It is a time like no other. But the first three and a half years is certainly no, no joke. It's not a pleasant time. Here we're reading about this anti, the Antichrist coming on scene in Revelation chapter 6. Right now we have a seven year period left. We have the rapture. We have the Antichrist. We have a peace treaty that he's going to make with the nations of Israel. We're going to have the abomination of desolation. Then we're going to have 1,260 days, another three and a half year period. And then Christ will come with his bride. Somebody said, well, the church, the church today has experienced tribulation, great tribulation. Yeah, the church has always experienced a level of tribulation, has always experienced a, a level of difficulty. There's always been trials on the church, and the origin of that is the enemy, Satan, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But in chapter 6, we just read it here just a few moments ago. In chapter 6, it's the Lamb of God. It's not the enemy. It's not the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's the, it's the Lamb of God. And I saw when the Lamb had opened one of the seals. It's the Lamb of God opening the seals. He's allowing His judgment. He's allowing His wrath to come upon a Christ-rejecting world. And no generation of the church has ever experienced that. And no generation of the church will ever experience that because Jesus tells us in His Word that we are not going to experience the wrath to come. We are not appointed to wrath, the Bible tells us. And this wrath, I want you to think about this as we get this picture in Revelation. Christ bore the wrath of God on my half, on my behalf. He bore the wrath that's going to be poured out here in the book of the Revelation on your behalf. He did it on the cross. He took the cup and he drank it. And not just some of it, he drank it all. If you read chapter 14, you're going to see the cup of wrath poured out without mixture on a Christ-rejecting world. And I want you to know that I'm glad that Jesus drank that cup of wrath on my behalf. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, that I was not, that you were not, that the church was not appointed to wrath. I believe it's naive for us even to believe there, to think that the first three and a half years are not difficult. But by chapter 16 and 17 of, of this same text, just flip over, in my Bible I have to flip over, but you look in verse 16 and verse 17 of this chapter that we're reading. It's not on the screen, but look here. It says, and said unto the mountains, these are, well, look in verse 15. It says, and the kings... And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man. That just about covers every man, doesn't it? Hid. They hid, folks. They hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The first three and a half years, the first seals are just opened. The first judgments of God are just being experienced. And man is looking for a cave to hide in because it's the safest place on earth to live. It's the most valuable piece of real estate. If you read the book of the Revelation, by the time you get to chapter 11, the two prophets who stand outside of Jerusalem prophesying for the first three and a half years, when they're killed, the whole world celebrates, the Bible says. Because they tormented the whole earth. It's not a party. The first three and a half years are unimaginable. The second three and a half years are unimaginable as well. But we're told in Luke, turn back to Luke chapter 21, as we see this white horse come on scene, and I believe it's Antichrist. In Luke 21, Luke chapter 21, look at verse 28. Stay with me here. A lot of information. Luke tells us this, And when these things begin to come to pass, when they begin, deception, war, famine, and pestilence, when they begin to come to pass, we're to do what? Look up 
and lift your heads, for your redemption, the rapture, draweth nigh. Jesus calls these times, in Matthew 24, we read it, the times of sorrows, literally birth pains. And that word or phrase is, is not used, well, it's used one other time in, in Thessal- Thessalonians. It's travail, a woman's sorrow. And, and women understand birth pains. Women understand birth pains. We talked last night about Braxton Hicks contractions. Everything leading up to the real thing, you know, we're like, we're, we're breathing. We're, these Braxton, Braxton Hicks, I'm not really in labor, I'm just fat, but, just, but uh, at least you're awake. These Braxton Hicks contractions, you know, that women experience. How many women know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we, we have the Braxton Hicks contractions, right? They're not the real thing, but they're coming. They're, they're the prelude. And, and you're practicing, you're breathing and all this. And that's the time we're in right now. But there's going to come a time, folks, when there will be no more Braxton Hicks contractions. No more breathing exercises. It becomes a screaming and hating the husband kind of thing. It intensifies. And I believe, I believe, folks, that we're in that transition period. So the first thing we identify here in Revelation chapter 6, in the first two verses, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. The first thing we do is identify who is the rider on the white horse. He comes on the scene real fast here. I believe at this point, it's my, my belief that deception is unrestrained at this point. Unleashed. God lifts his hand when this rider comes on. There are some say this. Well, that's Jesus, isn't it? That's Jesus. This is Christ coming on a white horse. But there's, there's some problems with that. He comes on a white horse, the Bible says here. He that sat, uh, and I saw in verse 2, I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. So he has a bow, he has no arrows. He has a crown, and he's coming to conquer, coming forth conquering, and to conquer. Well, see, Jesus is in heaven opening the scroll. He's not down here riding a horse. In verse 1 it says, I saw when the Lamb had opened one of the seals. The only thing in common that Jesus has with this rider is that he's on a white horse. That's it. In Revelation, keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 6, but you look back at Revelation chapter 19. But see what this rider has in common with Jesus. Look at verse 11 through verse 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. He's describing Jesus' return. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's Psalm chapter 2, you'll find that in there. And he treadeth the winepress of the the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The only thing in common that this man and Jesus Christ have in common is the white horse. Jesus is called the Word of God. His vesture is dipped in blood and he has the message of Almighty God. Here in in Revelation chapter 6, this person here on the horse is given a crown. It's, it's Stephano's crown. It's a victor's crown. But in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 12, he comes with many crowns, a diadem, royal crown. Here this rider is followed. If you look here in Revelation chapter 6, this rider is, is followed uh, in verse 3 and 4 by, uh, um, by war. He's followed in verse 5 and 6 by famine. And he's followed in verse 7 and 8 by pestilence. They're not good friends, folks. 
But when Christ comes back in Revelation chapter 19, we just read it, he comes followed by his kingdom, by the church. For a thousand year reign of peace. There's a big difference. This guy here that's on scene that we're studying in Revelation chapter 6 right now is the Antichrist. But what about his white horse? What about his white horse? Good guys come on white horses, don't they? He's not coming on, on a black horse with a cape going, <laughs> he's not doing that. He's about deception. He's brilliant. He's a genius. He's a great speaker, Daniel chapter 7 tells us. Daniel chapter 11 tells us. He's a peacemaker. I believe he's a military leader. I believe socially he's a uniter. He'll bring people together. And he's going to be what every, pe every person is looking for at that time. Do you remember when Jesus was feeding the multitudes? Do you remember what happened at that time? Do you remember what the people wanted to do to Jesus whenever he fed the multitudes? Keep your finger there and turn back to John chapter 6. I want to show you this. In John chapter 6, in verse 13 to 15, John chapter 6, verse 13 to 15, it says here, <clears throat> after he fed the multitudes, it says, he says, therefore they gathered them together, and they filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a what? King. He departed again into the mountain himself alone. That's, this is what happened. They tried to take, they, Jesus saw that they were going to take him by force and they were going to make him a king. That's what the world is going to look like, folks. That's the sort of king the world wants. I told our Sunday school class, this is, the, this is the kind of people that we vote for in every election. We want a king. We want somebody to take care of our problems. And Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his rule. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his rule, and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. What does that mean? I'm to seek God's ways. I'm to seek God's ways. That's the Antichrist coming here to conquer, conquering and to conquer. And what's he going to conquer? What's, who's he going to conquer? What's he going to conquer? He's going to conquer the hearts of men with deception that they should believe a lie. They would believe a lie. Keep your finger there. I want, to, I want you to see this. Turn back to 2 Thessalonians. I want to make sure you're awake. Turn back and forth all these scriptures. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, and says, And for this cause, those, look here, and for this cause, God shall send them. Who's them? That's they that heard and rejected the gospel. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the, not a, the lie. The lie of the Antichrist. Now look back up in verse 8 to 10. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This is the picture of the Antichrist. This is the picture of the hearts of men. And I don't believe, I believe the Antichrist is going to come on scene once, once the church is out of here. The world is going to be in such chaos at this time. He's going to be deceiving the hearts of men. And so we have the rising up of the Antichrist coming on scene. He's going to have all the answers. He's going to have a bow with no arrows. And Daniel tells us that he's going to make a peace treaty. He's going to make a seven-year peace treaty in the Middle East. Isaiah tells us that he's going, Israel is going to make a covenant with hell and death. And Jesus said in John chapter 5, if you want to turn back here, I want to show you this too. In John chapter 5 and verse 43. 
John chapter 5, verse 43, he says, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. He says, there will come another shall come in his own name, and him you will receive. I came in my own name, and you receive me not, but there's going to come another, and you'll receive him. This is going to be the guy that everyone wants, folks. People don't want Jesus. They don't want Jesus. And if you study the book of the Revelation, you see that playing out. But in our world, they don't want Jesus. They don't want you and I. They want this guy. The world wants this guy. And I want us to think about something because he's coming on scene. Listen, please, this is a time to come. He's coming on scene when the world will be shaken. Ezekiel in chapter 38 and 39, we're not going to turn there, but in chapter 38 and 39 talks about a war, talks about a battle, about Israel being invaded from the north. Some people don't know when that war will come, whether it'll be, whether it'll just precede the, the rapture of the church, it's going to lead into the rapture of the church, or whether it'll be later on. We don't know for sure. But there will be, there will be, uh, the world will be shaken. Even at the rapture of the church, the world will be shaken. I believe the oil cartels will be shaken. The economy of the world will be shaken. And, and look at the condition of our world today. And I don't want to belabor this, but I want you to think about this. People, and I, and I talked about this last week in my message in, uh, with Paul's letter to the Galatian church. The, the church doesn't know what's going on. The church is not aware of its surroundings. But if we're not aware of its surroundings, just walk down the street. We don't walk down the street in Todd. <laughs> There's no streets. But if you go to a city, walk down the streets. People are oblivious to what's going on in the world today. Everybody's doing this. Oops. This is what everybody's doing. Well, they're doing this. People don't know what's going on. They have all this technology, but they don't know what's going on. They're playing Pokemon. That's what they're doing. The Bible tells us that we're to walk circumspectly. Circumspectly. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, we're to walk circumspectly. We're, we are to have a working knowledge of what's going on in the world today. If you would tell somebody, walk down the street and tell somebody, hey, we're under attack. The United States of America is under attack. I told the Sunday school class this. It takes 25 minutes for an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. It takes 25 minutes. For that missile, once the button is pushed in Russia, to cross the pole and to get into the United States. 25 minutes. But here's the kicker. It takes our government 12 to 13 minutes to determine whether it's real or phony. So you have 12 to 13 minutes. What are you going to do in 12 to 13 minutes? You have enough time to run upstairs, look in the mirror, and kiss yourself goodbye. You don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of time, folks. Just imagine how shaken our world would be if a missile hit this country. Think how shaken our world would be, and I say world, if a missile hits this country because even as corrupt and bankrupt as our country is today, there are nations that still look to America for leadership and direction, and if they see her walls shaken here, they're shaken. The world will be shaken. And if there's any survivors from a, from a tragedy like that, any survivors at all, once this man of peace, once this man with a plan comes on scene, everybody's going to get in line. So this guy comes on scene. He, he comes on scene here in Revelation. He's riding a white horse. He comes with a plan to offer peace because the next horse and his rider is going to take peace from the earth. Daniel 8.25 says, By his peace... By peace he will destroy many. So look at verse 3 and 4 of Revelation chapter 6. We're not going to get too far here with this. We'll, we're going to cease for today and, and, and we'll try to continue next week. But look at verse 3 and 4. Verse, first two verses we see the Antichrist. Deception coming on scene with this first judgment released upon the world. The church is gone. With those that are left, deception. God's, God's hand of, of, of restraint gone off of deception. And he says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon 
look here, to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. It's interesting because it doesn't, it doesn't say power was given to him, power was given to him to create war. That's not what it says. It says to take peace. Folks, right now it's restrained. Can I ask you a question? How many of you think our country is at peace? How many of you think our world is at peace? It's restrained right now. If you don't think there's peace, if you don't think we're at peace, right now God is restraining. What is going to, if you don't think there's peace now, what's going to happen when God's hands of restraint are lifted? Listen, by God's own grace, this is being restrained right now. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to show you this. Let your fingers do the walking. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and look at the first eight verses. <clears throat> right now, God's grace, this is being restrained. Look, look, what, look what Paul tells this church. He says, but other times, listen, if you write in your Bible, highlight these words, but other times, times, and other seasons, brethren, you and I, you have no need that I write you. Paul says, I don't have to write this to you because I've already told you this. He says, for yourselves you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail. There's, there, you see, that's not, that's not Braxton, Braxton Hicks' contraction. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, big contrast, let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The times and the seasons. Keep your finger there. Look in Matthew chapter 16. The times and the seasons, Paul told this church, you should know in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1 to verse 3. Matthew 16, the first three verses, look what Jesus told the Pharisees. The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and he said unto them, When it is evening, when it's dark, and look, we have these sayings today, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Red at night or pink at night, sailors delight. In, the, in verse 3 it says, And in the morning it will be foul weather to, today, for the sky is red and low rain. You know, red in the morning, pink in the morning, sailors take warning. But look what he says at the end of verse 3. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but, you, but, but can ye not, but you cannot discern the signs of the times Jesus told the Pharisees, he held them accountable for the signs of the times. He told them. And I believe God holds us accountable to know the times. Jesus rode into Jerusalem 173,880 days after Daniel prophesied that he would ride into Jerusalem. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. In Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 19 and verse 41 and verse 42... Here's what Jesus told the disciples. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying this, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto your peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. God holds us accountable, just like he held them accountable, to know the times, to know the, the, the seasons. Even if you had known this thy day. 
But the Antichrist is going to come. This is what we read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, verse 8 verses. The Antichrist is going to come on scene, and then they're going to say, peace and safety, peace and safety, and then boom, sudden destruction. No remedy. I believe it will be like the days of Noah, folks. Eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage until the day when the flood came. This horse, this red horse now restrained, held back, will be permitted to ride forth without restraint. And peace is going to be taken from the earth. Peace taken from the earth. Listen to this, folks. And I want to close with this. Don't close your Bibles yet, but I want to close with this. It's estimated in 2008 there was a survey, there was a study done. In 2008, three estimated three trillion dollars globally per year is spent on military hardware. Three trillion dollars a year globally on military hardware. 8.5 billion, that's 8.5 billion a day. That's $344 million per hour. That's $6 million per minute. That is $100,000 per second on military hardware globally. All of that spent on military hardware. Listen, in all of that, please listen. All of that, one day, will be unrestrained. One year, and, and listen to this, one year of global military spending could feed the world. <laughs> one year, and, and I'm not opposed to, to military spending. Please, I'm not saying that because I'm in favor of that. But, listen to this, one year of global military spending could feed the world for 100 years. One year of global military spending could feed the world for 100 years. And people want to blame God and say, hey, where's the God of love? Why are people starving? Why are people starving in our world? And, and it's because man is screwed up. It's because man is a knucklehead. That they spend enough money to feed the planet for 100 years in one year. Man can't govern himself, and, and that's why Jesus is coming back, folks, to, to, strength, to straighten everything out. Today, listen to this. Today, there are 27 countries with long range. And we're talking about war here, so I'm going to finish out with these stats on war. Listen to this. Today, there are 27 countries with long range ballistic missiles. Today, 27 countries. 66, with, 66 countries with cruise missiles. And there are 11 countries with nuclear weapons. The United States of America has a nuclear weapon. Several. Russia. China, France, Britain, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And 40% of all global spending, 40% of all global spending on everything is spent on weaponry. The Saudi, Saudis have 120 CSS-2 missiles with a range of 1,500 miles. They have 120 of them. Israel's not happy about that. Iran has what's called the Sahab 4 missiles. They have a range of 1,240 miles. They're functioning today. Iran has a Sahab, S-A-H-A-B, Sahab 5 missile with a range of 3,100 miles today. But even more troubling than that, Iran has an older missile. It's called the Sahab 3. And, and what they've been doing the last several years with the Sahab 3 is, and we don't hear about it on the news, is that they've been test firing these Sahab 3 missiles at, in the Caspian Sea for years doing high level detonations. Now, why is that troubling to you and I? Yeah, Iran, Iran would want to wipe us off the map just as quick as anything else. But here's the troubling issue with the Sahab 3 missiles in the Caspian Sea, they're doing high level detonations. Here's why it's important EMPs. There's no country in this world that can defeat the United States in a nuclear war. None! But if Iran can sneak its ships up the Atlantic coast 
if an, uh, Iran can sneak its ships up the Pacific coast and they can launch a Sahab 3 missile into the air that has the range to reach the middle United States and detonate it at a high level altitude EMPs, electromagnetic pulses. And you know what they would do to the United States? They wouldn't destroy the United States off the map. They would send this country back 200 years. It would go back 200 years. They can't defeat us, but they would send us back 200 years. All that, all that capability right now is restrained. The United States, we talked about this in detail in our, my Sunday school class. The United States has 14, that, that's 10, 14, 10, 14, has 14, listen to this, U.S. Trident, T-R-I-D-E-N-T, look them up, Trident subs, Trident 2 SSBN subs. And each sub, each one of those subs has 24 missile tubes on them, each sub. All 14 of these uh, Trident subs together carry together carry 50 to 60% of the United States active inventory of strategic thermonuclear warheads. These subs are incredible. They park them under the ocean. They park them, they, they find a cork in the Earth's magnetic system, these Trident subs. They find a cork in the Earth's magnetic system. They park them under the ocean, and you can't see them on radar. They're gone. Here's what else they can do. Because if they find a cork in the Earth's magnetic system under the, under the ocean, and you have a whole fleet of carrier, carriers coming in that are on top of them, they have the ability to make them disappear off radar, these subs. Twenty-four tubes. Each one of them can be independently targeted on a city. Each one, 14 times 24, do the math, I didn't do it. Each one of these tubes can carry a 10 megaton warhead. Each one ship, one ship, one Trident, one U.S. Trident submarine can hold 400 cities hostage. 10 megatons. Do you know how big you said, well, I don't understand, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to get you a picture of war unrestrained, the, the, the possibility of war unrestrained in this world and, and the times that we live in. 10 megaton. Each tube can hold a 10 megaton warhead. One megaton is equal to 50 times Hiroshima. One megaton. 10 megaton is 500 times Hiroshima. One Trident sub, one U.S. Trident sub, get this, has 40 times, folks, please don't miss this, has 40 times the destructive power that every piece of weaponry used on, either, on every side combined during World War II. One Trident sub has 40 times the destructive power of every piece of military hardware used on every side during World War II. 50% of all scientific research is done on weapons systems. And this is the world that we live in. The point to all this is this, that it's restrained. And it's being restrained. And how long until some of this is unleashed? We don't know. But right now, everything that we experience is birth pains. Someday it's going to be released. Someday it's going to be unleashed. As a church, we need to know this stuff. It's healthy for us. Look, how many of you would, 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 would want your worst enemy, don't raise your hand, somebody will, would want your worst enemy to go through something like this? And, and, and this isn't even hell, folks. The lake of fire is to come for those that reject Christ. But this kind of destruction, this kind of unrestrained technology will be at man's free will, will be at man's disposal when God lifts his hand of protection. And he will during the tribulation period. The church won't be there. I believe it's healthy for you and I to have a picture of this. I don't want any of my friends or family to see this. 
And you know what? The, the, the potential for all this to be unleashed is, is terrifying. It's terrifying. And yet the church won't be here. The church will be out. We'll be gone. We'll be in glory. And man's heart is going to wax harder and harder and harder to the point where they point a finger at God and say, how dare you? How dare you? This, these are the times to come. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, we only saw two today. Deception, unleashed, unrestrained. War, unrestrained. The time's coming, folks. But glory to God's name. Glory to God's name that you and I won't have to see this. And we need to pray for those around us who do not yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray you got a better picture of the times to come. Next week we'll look at the last two. We'll look at the last two horsemen. We'll look at famine and we'll look at pestilence on the earth and maybe get a greater picture of the things to come. Would you stand with me this morning as we close? Father, as we come together this morning, I thank you so much for the book of the Revelation. And this has been something that, as I've been studying this over the last year and a half to two years, and that my eyes, even in a greater way, are open to the things that lie ahead. And not for the church, Lord, but for those who reject Jesus Christ. My prayer is that no one would ever have to experience these things to come. And yet, God, even in the midst of all the in the midst of all the chaos during that time, your mercy and grace is extended towards people. We pray for the church now, right now, the church, right now, your church, that people would know, that they would have an understanding, and, and, and not that, but they would have a desire to know. And Lord, maybe today we, we bring you honor and glory through the reading of the scriptures and know that because you face the wrath, my wrath and the wrath that I was supposed to face for me and for all of us in here, Lord, that you would get the glory for all of that. You make it possible for every man to see your face, and yet many reject. Many are not part of your kingdom. We thank you so much for this book. We thank you for what it provides us. And I pray, Lord, if there's one here today, maybe one watching by way of the internet or one watching by way of DVD or listening by way of CD, that you'd speak to their heart today. And Lord, you might encourage them. And, and maybe the, the reading of the scriptures this morning in Revelation chapter 6 would, would even, maybe even send a, a, a level of fear in their hearts that they don't want to see this time. And they might repent. And they might run to you. You draw them to yourself, Lord, and they'd just put down all the strongholds and things that they have, and they would run to you. Thank you for ministering to us. Speak to our hearts, Lord, today. Go with us as we leave this place. May we take the Word of God with us. May we take this wonderful book, even the book of the Revelation, with us and share it with anyone who has an ear that's willing to hear. This morning we want to sing glory to His name for what you provide for every one of us so that we might not see this very dark time. We thank you, and we pray it in his name. Amen.